Hi, thanks for watching. This is going to be my February wrap up. I realize it's a little late and it's also going to be pretty short because in addition to February being a short month, my reading time was cut even shorter by the fact that we adopted a puppy. So most of you probably know that we have a nine-year-old dog, part Basset, part Black Lab named Iggy that moved to Ohio with us from Texas. And when we moved, we didn't realize she was pregnant. And with her last litter, we kept one of the puppies. Two of them went to one of my sister-in-laws. Another sister-in-law took one. One of my nieces took one. And we kept Josie. Josie was, of course, a family dog like Yiji, but she was mostly John's. And she had, like, anxiety issues. Anytime he would leave, she would just sit there and whine, and she'd be sad. And he'd come home, and she'd sit on his lap and all night long. All night long, she'd sit on his lap until it was time to go to bed. And then she'd go to her cage and go to sleep. And in December, she got ran over. Um, me and my 11-year-old were outside walking the dogs, and Iggy can sometimes get a wild hair up her ass because she is used to wide open spaces where we lived in Texas and she's used to running. Um, and so we will keep her on a leash most times because she has been known to take off into either the field uh, one way or chasing chickens or crossing the road uh, to where my sister-in-law lives. And, you know, we live by a highway, so we can't have her crossing the other direction because that would be that would be terrible. But behind our house, or well, to the side of our house and then behind our house, there's a dirt road, and it it serves as a kind of alleyway. Really, the only people who use it are myself and the neighbor in the back corner um, because there's nobody else who who lives on the on the in the circle, and uh, like everybody else there their driveways are either on 42 or on or on the other road that that runs by us. Uh, Josie wasn't on a leash though and our neighbor turned down the street and Josie started chasing his truck and she normally does she, I mean, she didn't do that and we thought she would just bark at his truck and maybe get close to the the road and and run away but she didn't she kept barking and um he was on the phone with his mom he was on speakerphone so he had the the speakers with his mom talking and our other neighbor was outside and he turned to look at her because he caught the movement out of the corner of his eyes so in addition to not being able to hear us uh, yelling, he also didn't see Josie running at his truck, and he didn't see us running at his truck trying to stop Josie from running at his truck, and uh, just she got ran over, and it was it was terrible. My my 11 year old saw it, and that was when well, he was the one who convinced us to keep Josie from the litter instead of giving her away to family, and so it, it was it was his dog, even though she took to John, but. She was she was JJ's dog, and um, he ran to her and he picked her up and he was like my dog and it was the most heartbreaking moment of my entire life. And every time I closed my eyes for months after that, I I would see it happen over and over and over again. And because she w was also John's dog. Um, she loved John and John loved her. I didn't want him to have to come home after work and bury her. So I went and got a shovel and I was going to dig the hole by myself. I told JJ to go inside, but JJ wasn't hearing it. So he got another shovel and we dug a hole. And uh, when he went inside to get a measuring tape to make sure that I had dug down, that we had dug down deep enough that the coyotes in the area wouldn't smell her and dig her up, I just sat on the edge of the hole and cried, um, and it was it was really hard for all for the for the whole family. Um, you know, you'd never expect to to lose a dog. You certainly don't expect to your that your child is going to see the dog get run over. It was just absolutely terrible, and the neighbor felt terrible. Also, him and his wife came over, and he was crying and apologizing and asking if he could do anything. And um, my my poor son, he was like, "Call the cops on him." I'm like, "Baby." We didn't have her on a leash. 
it's not his fault. Um, and uh, when it first happened, I was I was really I was terrible. I, I I was yelling at him and I said some things and I had to go apologize later. Um, but a couple two three months later, two two months later, um, we finally decided to um, maybe look into getting another dog and. We were going to adopt a dog from the local animal shelter and we filled out the application. We were told we were approved. We went to visit the dogs that they had there. Um, none of the dogs that they had there, they were older One and two of them had been rescued from a hoarding situation. Um, neither one of those would come near us. Um, one of them came to us when we had a treat in our hand and walked away. And then the other one, you could tell that it had severe anxiety, I guess, from being in the situation that it had been in because it just it kept pacing back and forth throughout the whole room. And it was it was sad. I, I really liked that dog. And I was trying to convince John to, to give it a chance, but with having three kids in the house and another dog, we weren't sure it would be conducive to the dog's mental health to come home to the chaos. And uh, we were lined up to see four puppies that were in foster and two of them got adopted before we could um, have meet and greets with them. And then the other two, the foster families never contacted us to do a meet and greet. And finally we were, we were frustrated so, we started looking around um, on um, Nextdoor and um, puppies.com. I think it was puppies.com where we where we found what had, they had listed as mini Delilah. And she is a part Basset, part Cocker Spaniel. And Iggy is part Basset, part Black Lab. And mini Delilah was listed um, as a hush hound, which is or, or a miniature Basset hound. And she was so adorable in the picture. So we wrote to the people and they were like, yeah, we've had people say that they're going to come out and see her, but they never have. So we were like, well, we can go pick her up today. So we drove an hour to go pick her up and she was just so adorable. And John was like, oh, you don't want her? We can, we can go. And I'm like, uh, uh, no, put her in the cage. Let's go. And <laughs> we got home and, um, the neighbor his, the the one who accidentally ran over Josie, his wife saw us outside with the with the puppy, and she came over, and I told her I was like, it's a part basset hound, part cocker spaniel. She's like, well, I hope it doesn't have the cocker spaniel attitude because they can be vicious. This dog is so, oh my goodness, she's a psychotic demon sloth. First of all, if you Google how long do basset hound puppies sleep, they can sleep between 18 and 22 hours a day, which is completely true. If she's asleep and, and we're going to go to bed and you pick her up, she cat melts over your arm. She could fall asleep at the drop of a hat. And um, she, but the time that she is awake, oh my goodness, she is so crazy. We've seen her run from the living room to across the kitchen to the bathroom door, run into the bathroom door, turn around, run back across the kitchen, which she slides across the, the linoleum and then back into the living room and turn around and do it again. And she's an aggressive chewer. She chews everything. She has a million chew toys and still she chews the the furniture, the walls, my desk, my books, our fingers, everything. And we try to take her outside when she's when she's got that wild hair up her butt. And she will go from leaf pile to leaf pile. <laughs> and I don't know whether she's just playing or whether there's something about the leaf pile that scares her, but she's obsessed with the leaf piles. She'll run to one and jump in and then she'll yelp a little bit and she'll jump out of it and then run to another one. <laughs> it's so weird. Iggy, we thought Iggy was going to be excited about having a new puppy because she didn't have her, her puppy from her last litter anymore. And I call her a puppy. Josie wasn't a puppy when we lost her. She was three years old, but um, we thought Iggy was going to be excited to have another dog in the house. She did not look at me for two days straight. She would not come to me. She wouldn't sit in my lap. And yes, my 50, 60 pound Bassett 
sits in my lap on a regular basis. She thinks he's the lap dog. She's also alternately thought she was a cat because she used to sit on the top of couches and take cat naps in the sun. Um, and she, she also adopted two kittens at one point. Uh, but that was years ago. But I couldn't believe it. Iggy, she wouldn't come to me. She wouldn't sit in my lap. She she wouldn't look at me. I'd be like, Iggy, and she'd turn up her nose and look away. Um, I'm like, what is happening here? She wouldn't play with the puppy. She was growling at it the whole time. But then on the third day, when I took them outside, the, she started playing with the puppy. And they would chase each other around a little bit. And I said, Iggy, look, you like the puppy, and she immediately stopped. These these dogs, they 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 have really funny characters, and they are smarter than we think they are, more intelligent, more. And um, but she did. She came around. Iggy came around too. Um, we we renamed Minnie Delilah. We renamed her Luna Simone, and. I, I should have named her Lola. So I could be like, run, little run, every time she gets that wild hair. But, but, but Iggy and her, they, they play a lot now. And this dog loves to bite Iggy. She'll nibble at her ears and her jowls and her neck and her legs and her tail and her nose. And Iggy, she, she's so funny. Like, once she realizes that Luna wants to play rough like that, she'll immediately fall over onto her back with her paws in the air and, you know, be like, oh, you got me. And she'll let Luna, like, bite at her and nip at her for a good while <laughs> eventually she gets frustrated and she'll start nipping luna back and then luna of course is like she'll yelp and be like why are you being so mean to me <laughs> so that that's been the last half of that was the last half of my february and of course she's not she's not potty trained so there's a lot of taking her out or i say potty trained like i i'm obviously i've obviously had a lot of kids she's not housebroken yet so there's a lot of taking her out. There's a lot of vacuuming um, so that I can shampoo um, the carpet after she pees. And I can't tell you how many times I've shampooed the carpet in this house. I'm eventually going to shampoo the carpet right into non-existence. But she's getting better. She doesn't poop in the house anymore. And she's she's limited her the places that she pees to about two spots. One of them is in front of JJ's door. And one of them is the runner carpet out in the hallway. And we try to keep the puppy pads down, but we don't want her to get, we don't want her to think that it's okay to just go on the puppy pads and not tell us she has to go outside. But anyway, so I read two novels and one poetry book, and here I am doing the February wrap-up. Yay me! So I read The Cabinet of Dr. Lang, and this is a this is an ARC that I got from NetGalley, and I was so stoked. I love Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. I've been huge fans of the Agent Pendergast series for a very long time, at least 14, 15 years, maybe longer. And so this goes back to some of the characters and histories that were in one of his earlier books. I think it was one of the first three books, The Cabinet of Curiosities which is actually the first book that I read by them that really got me into, into this series. So in this book, you have Constance Green, and she is she was affected by something done to her in the 1800s by a doctor who was messing around with trying to find the key to immortality. And in this book, she uses a, a, a time machine, and we use that term lightly because it doesn't actually take you back on the same timeline that we're in. It puts you in an alternate universe where the timeline is, is similar. There might be slight differences, um, but you don't have that problem with like running into yourself. Like it's not gonna change like the whole future or kill your grandfather or whatever it is. So she uses the time machine to go back to the 1800s because she's going to try to save her brother and sister from uh, her brother had gotten put in jail for a little bit for, I think, theft. And then after he got out, he was pickpocketing somebody and they killed him. And then her sister was actually one of the uh, first victims of Dr. Lang, who is the one who eventually figured out the formula and tested it on Constance, which is why she ages so slowly. And because it, it takes place in like 
Pendergast is modern day. Dr. Lang is like his great, 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 great grandfather or something. So she, she goes back using the time machine. The problem though, is that when she uses it, the time machine destroys itself. It, it, it explodes, there's pieces everywhere. So Agent Pendergast enlists the help of a disgraced NASA scientist, uh, Gaspard Ferenc, to help him rebuild the time machine. And Ferenc is at first very skeptical. Um, he has become a recluse. He lives in the middle of nowhere off the grid. Is kind of shocked um, when he's found. But he accepts the position because it, it's got a lucrative payout. And it, like we're talking half a million dollars. And so he takes the job and when he realizes that it works, he his mind is just blown. The reason Pendergast is having him do this though is because Pendergast wants to travel to the same timeline that Constance has gone to because he doesn't think that her revenge plot is going to work out the way she thinks it is. Because not only does she want to save her brother and sister, but she wants to kill Dr. Lang as well. The thing is, is Dr. Lang is a brilliant, brilliant person despite his lack of moral aptitude. Now, in addition to that, you have two investigators who had previously worked with Dr. Pendergast. One is investigating a crime that happened at a museum and the other is investigating a crime that happened on an Indian reservation. And they find that their two separate investigations actually circle back on each other and might be connected. So they start working together trying to figure out what exactly happened, why was this person murdered in a uh, in a freezer at the museum, why was this person murdered on a cliff at the reservation? And this takes one of them overseas to South America. It takes them internationally to what they believe is an art thief. And that one is trying to lure the art thief back to the States so he can be arrested. The other one, meantime, meanwhile, is enlisted by Pendergast to go to the alternate timeline history with him to try to find Constance. And so you have all this kind of circling together and then you have Ferenc and, and after, um, after Pendergast uses the time machine, Ferenc is like, well, I can go back and I can get these items that I know that they had back then that would be worth a fortune. Like the, the, the profit would be exponential based off of, you know, going back and purchasing these items and then selling them, coming back to the current time and selling them. And you start to think that everything's going to kind of start to work together and then everything falls apart. <laughs> and the... The thing is that most of the Pendergast novels can be read as standalones. This one, however, I got to the end and it was a to be continued and I was just shocked. I was like, are you serious? Um, but of course, I'm, I'm definitely going to be reading the follow up to it. Um, I forgot how intriguing these books were because as you can obviously tell, it, it touches on metaphysical, esoteric stuff, but it is also highly scientific and it makes an interesting combination and, and uh, subgenre of thriller or subgenre of science fiction. It's, I, I've always loved these books. They're, they're really incredible. Um, and then I read Pinata by Leopold Gout and this is also an ARC that I received from NetGalley. So thanks to NetGalley for these two wonderful ARCs. So when I read the synopsis, I, w I just quickly read bloody history of the pinata and I was sold. I was like, yes, please. And it starts with a, a brief touch of history, of ancient history from, from Mexico um, and what was part of the Mesoamerica uh, places. And then it jumps to modern time and we start following the story of Carmen Sanchez and her two daughters. Now, Carmen Sanchez is an architect and despite being an architect in the 21st century, she's working for a firm that is still very patriarchal. And so she is intent on making her mark. And when she gets the opportunity to travel to Mexico, which is actually where she was born, to remodel, reconstruct and repurpose an old church into a hotel, she jumps on the chance because not only can she kind of delve into her history and show her daughters who are really, they're New Yorkers. 
Um, but she could also make a name for herself in her firm that she hopes will continue throughout the rest of her career. So she takes her two daughters and she travels to Mexico. And the older daughter is mad because she was supposed to go to a theater camp with her friends and all of her friends are going and she's missing out on this great opportunity. She's very sulky about it. She's always looking at her phone. And the younger daughter is the complete opposite. She's soaking up the sun, the food, the culture. She's just living life and, and loving it. And while Carmen has to deal with patriarchal firm back in America, she knows that in Mexico, it's going to be probably even worse, but she doesn't realize the extent of it. She has to pay people above the agreed price to bribe them to bring the stuff that she paid for. She has to go through a whole bunch of red tape with getting permits. And then to, not to mention the people that she has hired to do the actual work because she's not going to be the one tearing stuff down and rebuilding and adding stuff. The people who she's hired to do that, they look at her not as one of their own, even though she was born in Mexico, they look at her as an American and an American woman. And there's a lot of pushback from the people who are even working under her. And it's really starting to frustrate her. Now, one of the people that she works with has a friend and that friend sees her younger daughter out in the marketplace. And she realizes that this girl has this brilliant light, this life that is shining through. And it's shining through to the dark places on the other side of what we can see. And something dark and something ancient is now stalking this little girl intent on using her as a vessel. And I'm, I'm trying not to give too much away because not only do I not want to ruin the ending, I don't want to ruin things that happen like between the beginning and the ending because there's scenery changes. But this was a phenomenal book and I was just completely taken by the way the author was able to go from explaining the nuances of a construction site and the everyday life of a mother who is arguing with her daughter and another girl, another daughter who is on the cusp of teenager and seeing how she moves from being this bright and happy and joyful little girl to something darker taking place and then he can and then shifting to this surreal like scary dolly-esque but also like um like ancient mexico dolly-esque type s scenery almost like a dream like like she's she's awake and then all of a sudden like the the scenery changes and you can see it happening in your head and it, he was so he, he did such a good job explaining the the different um uh, the different things that were happening to carmen and to her daughter and changing from reality to this dream space or or history or ancient or other world alternate world it, it was just so incredibly written it was pretty violent uh, in, in a lot of places and uh, it does touch of course like I said on not only the patriarchal society that we still run into in certain um, in certain careers in the United States but also um, what happens when a woman tries to take over like a high position in Mexico and it touched on like how many missing posters were in the town of girls who were kidnapped in 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 their area and it touched on the the wider aspect of um the missing women and the missing girls and the drug trade down there and it was it was really well put together it didn't feel like it was too much at any point and it was it was phenomenal i i i loved it and then i read the um the Dirty Poetry, which is a poetry book written by the lead singer of Five Finger Death Punch, Ivan Moody. And I did do a review of that because I wanted to share like what the book looked like and some of the the way that the lettering was done and the artwork because the lettering and the artwork were not done by Ivan Moody. He wrote the 
he wrote the poems that were in there um, and then had somebody else kind of stylize it with that with that artwork and the lettering, which was really phenomenal. So I talked more about my dogs than I did about the books, I, I, I suppose, but that was my February. Right now I'm reading um, the left-handed the Left-Handed Booksellers of London by Garth Nix, and I'm right at the end, and so I'm about to start The Sinister Booksellers of Bath, which is the next book in the series, because I got The Sinister Booksellers of Bath as an ARC, but I hadn't read The, the Left-Handed uh, Booksellers of London yet, so I'm, I'm going to be reading those back-to-back, -back, and I'm also reading Monstrilio by Gerardo Samano Cordova, and this is about a woman who her son dies and she takes a small snippet of his lung and feeds it with love and it grows i'm not too far into the book yet but it, it was it started pretty heartbreakingly um but i'm i believe it's going to be like a frankenstein-esque type thing but it, it it's the premise sounds really intriguing to me so Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe below.